Welcome everyone to the first unexpected episode of Breaking Zcash. Uh, it, it's an unexpected timely episode where we talk about the security and privacy limitations of Zcash, sort of like what we did with the Breaking Monero episodes. Although given the timing of this one, it's going to be a little bit more rough and less structured than our, or less focused a little bit than our Breaking Monero episodes typically are. Future episodes will probably be a little bit more focused if we have them at all. Um, and this one's a little bit more of an analysis about news that has gone on. But today we are talking about the recent counterfeiting vulnerability that Zcash disclosed yesterday. So Sarang is on with me to talk about it. Uh, brief introductions. Um, I'm Justin. I'm a student at the University of Minnesota. Um, we have Sarang here. Sarang, want to introduce yourself to everyone who might be watching for the first time. Yeah, so um, I'm Sarang Nother. I'm one of the PhD researchers who works with Monero as part of the Monero Research Lab. Excellent. So Sarang and I thought that we would start off by going through Zcash's original blog post showcasing what it is, just covering like a super high level of what happened. And then we can go in more detail about what a little bit more of the nuances and what this means for certain groups of people and, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to share my screen right now with that. Da, 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 da. Sorry, oops. It'll take me one more second. I uh, put it on the same screen. So let me just swap that over. And three, two, one, here we go. Okay, so here's the blog post. So it's a very thorough post. There's a lot of information in here. I highly recommend that everyone reads this in, in far more detail. It's broken up into several different parts. Um, so first, basic summary, um, they found 11 months ago that there was a counterfeiting vulnerability in the cryptography that, was, that um, Zcash was built on. Um, ultimately, um, so we're going to dispute this, but they claim the counterfeiting vulnerability has been fully remediated in Zcash and no action is required by Zcash users. Again, we'll come back to that. But um, someone who worked for the Zero Coin Electric Coin Company first found the vulnerability and they took steps to make sure that it was um, like the proper patches were, were made, that in the time the, the scope for uh, the, the attack scope was, was mitigated as, as well as they could have during the time period. Um, they argue that it was not, it was likely not exploited for several reasons. Um, they claim that you need to be highly technical to, to discover this, that it discovered for years before and went through other passes of review, um, that the current signal for what would help indicate that it was used has not been met. We'll talk about this in far more detail. Um, that they mitigated the possibility of exploitation after they found the vulnerability and that they studied for, um, they're very vague here. Um, so they say that they, they're looking to see that the attack might leave a specific footprint and they haven't found it. They do not elaborate further on this. So Sarang and I can speculate a little bit more about what this might mean. Um, what they're, we're really trying to indicate here. But the Zcash team believes that counterfeiting has not occurred. Um, we'll come back to this though. Um, talking about some of the key points, again, they found the, the counterfeiting vulnerability. Um, it was, um, and it was only patched in October with the sapling upgrade where users could no longer generate Sprout transactions uh, so could no longer generate transactions to the Sprout pool, so people could no longer, from that point on, generate new funds in the Sprout pool that would that would be able to take advantage of this this exploit. Um, proceed. So, and they kept it quiet for the months um, when it, when it was first discovered. Um, it was about uh, about a ten month period, I believe. Um, we can go through. Um, yeah. So in March, it was originally discovered by uh, Ariel Gabazon, um, who worked for Zcash, was going through some previous ones. They speak in here in more detail about what the proof was and the research papers in which the, the, the faulty proof was included in. So um, that's additional background you can, you can see after this video if you'd like. And um, they can speak a little bit more detail um, about how it actually um, could be exploited here. Um, do you think it would be useful to really go in detail here, Sarang, or do you think that it would be good to just refer people to this? Um, I mean, it's. I think 
I think that it is good to go through just at least a little bit of what happened. And again, the blog post is very detailed. So, you know, kudos uh -huh. to the team for being very open about, you know, what the timeline was and what is affected. Um, but basically the idea is that the proving system that was originally used in the initial um, Sprout uh, circuit design. So that was kind of the original trusted ceremony prior to the one with Sapling, which is not affected by this. Um, essentially the proving system that was used for that, um, there was an error in one of the soundness proofs. Um, and it was also determined that I'm um, kind of, you know, going along with that, that part of the parameter generation process yielded some parameters that could kind of be reverse engineered in a way in order to generate false proofs. Um, and now while those particular parts of the parameters do not appear in like the actual final Zcash you know, implementation that you would download and use, um, they did actually appear in the transcript that was, um, that was released as part of that ceremony. And it is noted in there as well that you know, the instantiation of ZK snarks that were used in the Sprout circuit, um, Sprout circuit design um, were not the only ones. There were other additional instantiations that were affected and others that were not. And they do a good job of listing which of those were. It's also worth noting that you know you can still send to Sprout addresses today, and of course send Sprout from Sprout addresses today. Uh, but after the sapling ceremony, the proving system that is used for those transactions is different and not affected. So that's why today it's no longer possible to generate such a false proof. Thanks, Ring. So we covered um, going back to this document here. Um, Sring also covered like what is affected, what is not affected. Um, and then from there on, it goes to talk about the third party disclosure. From here on out, it talks about how they reached out to other third parties and, and basically talked to them about the vulnerability. Ultimately, what this means is that with Zcash, um, it was patched uh, within Zcash before they went out to talk to others, which Sarang and I personally generally agree is, is the right way to do it um, because you don't want to reveal to other teams that might have lower standards potentially and, and give them an opportunity to compromise the Zcash network, of course. Um, and then from here, they have the timeline of events a little more specifically. I encourage everyone to read through this, but um, ultimately, um, uh, one last point I think we really want to make is that in order to explain to perform this exploit, they needed a copy of the transcript, correct, Sarang? Um, yes. Okay, so you can see here that um, they document the steps that were taken in order to reduce availability of this transcript. So it was originally, um, shortly after Zcash launched, um, available to everyone on, on a public web facing website, on, on the Zcash website. Um, and the, once they discovered that this was a potential vulnerability or a vulnerability, right? They took the transcript down and eventually deleted all local copies of it. And they eventually had to restore these copies uh, through through other methods. So th this is an important, like this is quite a, a long month window, right? But this basically involves them um, hiding the transcript in the, in the best way that they really knew available and making it so that, and justifying why they did not have a transcript available at that time. And then on October, they upgraded. And then from then on, you can talk about that. They just, they cover the steps that were taken um, by other organizations um, and other, and other briefings in order to um, cover the rest of the discovery process with other teams and other parts of the, the Zcash ecosystem. So I think that covers most of the info in that blog post there. Um, so a lot of info, I think it was really important though to sort of cover this, this base level of what happened um, within, within like Zcash, I think. Um, so uh, from there, get my notes organized one more time. So, um, so, so ultimately, in summary, I guess, what, what do we know? Ultimately, what are the real key takeaways from this? Um, and I think the first one is that um, this, this was a, a critical flaw that would have allowed people to print more Zcash without other individuals knowing. And we can talk about some ways where we could detect bad behavior, but there's no way to prove that bad behavior did not happen. Um, so people could have generated funds and it's possible that we don't know. Um, and there's no way to prove that that has not happened based off the way that Zcash has its privacy proving system. Um, so when Zcash, when the Zcash team says that, 
Um, the counterfeiting vul vulnerability has been fully remediated in Zcash. Um, it's more accurate to necessarily say that they have patched the bug, so no further exploits can be taken, but there's no way to prove that it necessarily has been fully remediated. Rather, they're sort of hoping that that's the case. Would you say the same, Serang? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of subtle, right? So so in, in my mind, there's kind of two ways to look at calling this, you know, being exploited or not being exploited. You know, there's the exploitation of saying that, you know, prior to the sapling upgrade, when this was kind of fixed in consensus, um, prior to that point, you know, it would have been possible to, you know, generate false proofs, you know, that would have basically represented transactions for funds you did not have access to. That's the idea of the inflation bug. So there's, there's that part of it. That is now not possible anymore. You know, any proofs that were generated at that time and are false, you know, as far as we know, you know, those exist. And as far as we know that those are not directly detectable, you know, if they are directly detectable, you know, no one is illustrating how this could directly be done. Um, but of course, we know too that um, there's the idea of being able to exploit it in terms of actually being able to access and pull out those funds. So Zcash um, introduced with the sapling, um, with the sapling release, the idea of a turnstile or transparent migration, where in order to bring funds from these old Sprout addresses, these shielded addresses, to the new type of shield addresses, sapling addresses, which are also not vulnerable to this. You have to move your funds through the transparent pool and in the process, temporarily reveal the value of those funds. So the idea for how that they plan to basically check for this is to say that, well, we know the number of Zcash that have been minted. We can kind of track the amounts in these pools. And if we notice that more money is coming out of Sprout addresses than should have been made available, then we know that someone is has exploited in terms of generating bad proofs and is also attempting to exploit by pulling more funds out than they have access to. Um, and the Zcash company does in fact, in fact, previous uh, to this release, had released a blog post, I think a couple months ago, perhaps, that basically said what they would do if they discovered that this happened. And one of the things that they indicated they might do. Yeah, real quick, was, sorry, uh, before, before we jump into that, I'm just uh, going to go what what we really mean by looking at the total amount in the, sh in the Sprout Shielded Pool. Um, so um, again, pull up another doc. We have a lot of a lot of a lot of websites for you today. So. Um, you can see here that uh, there's this one block explorer Z chain, which is it's definitely the, the major block explorer for, for Zcash. And they have um, three different value pool statuses. These are, are new to the website. So they have the transparent pool, they have the sprout shielded pool, and the sapling shielded pool. And we also know, as an outside observer, what the full what the total supply of Zcash should be at any given block. So what, what what this means is if this sprout shielded pool like um, grows small, right? Um, that if you had an attacker like the um, okay, so let me take a small step back. So what this is saying that if the Zcash network was not exploited, there should be this many Zcash in the sprout pool, and or or, or less than that, you know, over time. Right. So, so if an attacker is essentially transparent about them achieving this, this vulnerability or other vulnerabilities, then um, what would happen is uh, like through this signaling model, someone pulled out like, uh, let's say this is 267,000 Zcash. If someone pulled out 500,000 Zcash out of the Sprout Shielded Pool tomorrow, that would be a clear indicator that someone had performed an exploit on the Sprout Shield of the Pool because there's no there's there's no legitimate way for that to have occurred properly. No, um, and in fact, you'll notice as you were scrolling over that um, in that little tooltip box, it even said to note that this value should never be negative. So mm -hmm. essentially, you can do a negative check, and you know that if that number tries to grow negative, it means that people are trying to pull out more funds than actually existed in the pool, which means <laughs> that inflation took place you know, undetected until that point. Exactly. And then the one thing we, we of course want to note though, is that just because this number is non-negative does not mean that it has not been exploited. It's right. possible that suppose, like suppose a case like Serang had um, money in a Sprout address and then Serang unfortunately lost all of his keys in a boating accident and no longer has access to this, the Sprout, right? And 
an attacker is like, okay, well, I'm going to assume that like X percent on average of coins in the Sprout address are probably lost in some way. And I think it's likely that at least some Sprout are lost. I think it's unlikely this number will ever go to zero, right? Mm -hmm. um, just based off the nature of people occasionally lose things. So the attacker might depend on that and they might withdraw an amount that other that, that would not cause this to appear as negative. And mm -hmm. um, we don't know that's the case. It could have been exploited and some person is, is, is truly doing this. Um, and as far as we know, there's no way to prove that that is not the case, uh, or at least it has never been shown how you could prove it with, uh, how you could prove that that has not happened. Right. And I mean, this is, this is, I think, really the problematic part that leads at least to me to believe that this issue is not remediated. Um, because essentially, as long as honest users leave money in the shielded pool, it would be possible for an attacker to basically max out the shielded pool. At that point, if that negative check is triggered, that means that all these honest funds that are left in the pool would likely be frozen if the Zcash company decided to freeze the remaining funds in that pool. So this is very problematic. It means that at any point going forward, until and unless it's someday not possible to use Sprout addresses anymore, um, you know, it, it would be possible for an attacker to essentially lock other honest users' funds out. Exactly. There'd be no way to know if this is going to happen until and unless it were to happen. Yeah, exactly. And we can see here, um, I mean, we can give Zcash credit for clearly documenting what they would do if there is counterfeiting in a shielded pool. But if we scroll down to the, the bottom here, it says um, upon detecting this condition, the condition being funds were, were generated that should not ex uh, exist, um, <clears throat> they search into the vulnerability. If we're able to identify a bug that affects only a single shielded pool, for example, this vulnerability we're disc discussing today, which is only valid for SAP, uh, for, uh, sorry, for Sprout, not Sapling, yes. we might choose to effectively deactivate that pool by invalidating any of its outgoing transactions. A necessary consequence of this action is that any legitimate funds would also be lost forever in the affected pool. So they give themselves some some room to act under like a different circumstances. They still give them some, some ability to not go forward with this action, but they have stated that their their most likely source of action, and we've confirmed this with, with other members of the Zcash team, is that if there was an exploit um, within Sprout, that they would lock funds that, that were generated um, as a result. So if you are a user and you have money in the Sprout shielded pool, you have a financial incentive to get your money out as soon as possible. Um, because ultimately, if an attacker was to just withdraw, you know, this exact amount of, of, of Zcash in the Sprout pool, and then you go to withdraw yours, well, then you're likely going to trigger that lock process and you're not going to retain your funds. They're going to um, prevent you from withdrawing your funds. And unfortunately, there's no way to know if an attacker or legitimate user is withdrawing these funds. And um, as a result, you, you likely would, if, if you're a legitimate user, there's a, there's a probability that you will lose your funds that are stored in Sprout. So you certainly have, it's essentially a race between you and an attacker. The attacker wants to get their funds out before you. So that's pretty interesting. So when Zcash says that no action is required by Zcash users, we, we, Sarang and I disagree. We say that if you have funds in Sprout, you ideally, from, this, from a security standpoint, should get your funds out as soon as possible. Um, and, you know, and to be fair, the Zcash company, you know, when they instituted this turnstile process, of course, recommended that users you know, move funds out and into Sapling. You know, I mean, we could probably argue now that part of it, perhaps part of the reason for, you know, kind of that semi urgency and their insistence to do that, you know, is because the company for a while knew about this flaw. I um, mean, it's worth noting that 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 plan that they that Justin just showed um, was was written, you know, well after the company knew about this bug and had a remediation plan in place. So it's also important to note um, that performing the so-called turnstile or transparent migration which as we've said now is, you know, you have a, a financial incentive to do should also be done safely and correctly. So even though there is, you know, kind of a race condition to get these funds out as quickly as possible, um, that is not a safe idea. There are, there are good ways and there are worse ways 
to move your funds out in a way that you know tries to avoid linking and detection. Um, and it's also worth noting that you know while the Zcash company has released a statement you know indicating a safe way to do this, to my knowledge, only one non-official wallet you know will support any kind of delayed turnstile migration on its own. Users who don't use that wallet or who wish to be you know, you know, more in line with the Zcash company's recommendation are probably on their own to do it manually until and unless the Zcash company releases a tool to help folks with this. But as far as I know, there is no such tool at this point. So it's, 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 it's kind of a, it's kind of a no-win situation depending on how, you know, risky you view this as being. If you feel that there's a very high risk of this trigger happening, you want to move your funds out fast. Uh, but at the same time, if you want to be as safe as possible, you want to delay it somewhat according to their recommendations. Yeah, it's, it's really an unfortunate situation for Sprout holders at the moment because you have one of two options, right? You're basically saying, do you prefer, at the moment, do you prefer privacy or security? <laughs> Which one's more valuable to you? Do you want to have um, the lowest possible risk of financial loss? In which case, you should move your funds right now, right? Um, but know that in doing so, you are probably doing so in a way that reveals a ton of information um, about you. Like if, if you just take your, your whole Sprout holdings and empty them out as soon as possible, you're making transparent the amount and you're, you're giving actually a, a quite a bit of insight into the, to the happenings you did on, on Zcash, even including on, in the Sprout system. Um, right. There's a, we all know that there's metadata associated with any transaction and, you know, revealing additional information about large amounts of money is probably not a good addition to that metadata set. Right. And the way to mitigate this, of course, I mean, to, to, to be very clear, it would be great if we did not, for, for the sake of privacy, that you would not have to have this turnstile process. But um, even so, there, there's no current, like they have a documented process now about how a turnstile should occur. And um, there is a, an unofficial wallet that supports so, at least some form of turnstile. I haven't verified whether or not it meets all of these requirements. The requirements were only finished about two weeks ago, um, but I noticed that there were more recent updates to, to this wallet's turnstile process. I just, I don't know the, the, the current state of it. But nevertheless, um, Zcash is essentially they, they say no action is required, but there are certainly benefits for doing it immediately. And there's certainly benefits for waiting until ev hopefully a lot of people are going through this turnstile process. This would be a much easier situation for users if, if the turnstile process was developed for the initial upgrade. Um, and, and the Zcash team says that this turnstile upgrade is it has not been mandated as a result of this vulnerability. It has not, uh, it has been an idea that they have um, talked about for a long time. It's been part of the design decision for a long time. I just wish that it was implemented. The, there's more urgency in how it was implemented so that if there was a situation like we are in today, that we don't have a situation where users are encouraged to you know, hastily take their funds out as a result of a vulnerability um, and ultimately strongly degrade their privacy. So I think that it's, it's a really unfortunate situation for really everyone around. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. It's a, it's a very, I mean, to be clear, it's a very, very tough situation. Um, you know, other projects have had inflation bugs. You know, Bitcoin suffered an inflation bug that was patched it was, you know, it was able to be determined that that was not exploited. Um, Monero, uh, a while back, also had an inflation bug. You know, that one was handled internally as well and patched, and it was able to definitively be determined that that also, you know, was not exploited. So, you know, bugs in cryptographic systems happen. Um, and this was a particularly tough one because, you know, Zcash had to make a lot of decisions about whether or not to hard fork early, how to release this, what to do about the whole transcript availability situation. So they had a lot of tough calls to make. You know, anyone in the position of having to make those calls and, you know, it's easy to play, you know, armchair cryptographer after the fact and think about how you might or might not do it. Um, but there are definitely a lot of lessons to learn from this. Um, and to be fair, I think there's a lot that the Zcash company still could and should do. Um, I personally believe that, you know, to, to make a statement that it's fully remediated and no action is required 
is a bit hasty and I think a little bit disingenuous to users who still have funds in Sprout. So I would personally call on the Zcash company to be much more open about some of these consequences and to provide much better and more clear guidance to their users on what to do. You know, a special shout out has to go to the Zcash Foundation, which is a legally separate entity from the Zcash company um, and which has actually released a separate statement regarding this vulnerability, you know, where they do praise the Zcash company for, you know, handling this, you know, to some extent the best that they probably could have, according to them. But they also do call on the Zcash company, you know, to, to do a lot more with the, for users, especially regarding the turnstile migration. So, you know, kudos to the foundation for, for really holding them to task. And, you know, I hope that, I hope that, you know, we all can learn something from this um, and that, you know, users, you know, can do this migration safely. Absolutely. So before we move on to key takeaways, is there anything else you want to talk about, Serang? And I, I know there's a lot to unpack here. Um, there there is a lot to unpack, you know, and there's, there are a lot of, there are a lot of really fascinating kind of side stories about each of these things, you know, the, the, you know, the, the white lie deception that was involved with the transcript, you know, involved a lot of other people and a lot of other, I think, personal consequences that we don't really have to go into here. Um, you know, the question of the turnstile migration and how that handled was also fascinating, you know, definitely read on, up on the blog posts um, for, from the Zcash company and also the Zcash foundation on this. Certainly. Um, so some of the big key takeaways again is that, um, just to summarize, Zcash found and patched an inflation vulnerability, but there's no way to prove that it was not exploited. There are some indicators that we can use to say that it was, to show that it was, um, but, um, <clears throat> but we don't, we, we can never prove that it had not happened. Um, and then for users, they are encouraged to take their funds out as soon as possible because Zcash as, as a company has clearly stated that if there was an inflation vulnerability, they would do their best to, to, to mitigate that as much as possible, including the loss of legitimate funds in, in these sort of systems. So if, if you're a user in Sprout, you should get your funds out as soon as possible. And I would say, ideally throw them in saplings so they can't lock them also, right? <laughs> um, if you keep them in the transparent address, they theoretically could, could still lock them. So um, if, I, if I had money in Sprout, I would immediately put it in sapling. Um, in the, it, following the best process that I could under the turnstile process, but nevertheless, this process still is not easy and accessible to most users. And so ultimately users are in a really tough position um, as a result. Um, so there's a, there's a long summary of events that came here. There's a lot of independent points that were worked on independently, but sort of have come together to all make this way into this, this big mess here. Um, but <clears throat> Ultimately, it's a great learning lesson for Zcash, um, the, the company, the foundation, the rest of the ecosystem. And it's certainly something that I think the rest of the cryptocurrency community can look to also. Um, so, I mean, there, there's no, from what Serang and I can tell, we think generally um, the, the process for patching the vulnerability, we, we think like, I think the two of us would agree, like we probably would have done similar things in terms of patching the vulnerability, right? Um, I would have done very, I, I probably would have handled things regarding, um, you know, the whole transcript situation a lot differently. Um, but, you know, but, but the idea that, you know, it had to be removed to, you know, reduce its availability and therefore the attack surface, I mean, that point is pretty straightforward. Yeah. Okay. And there are any last key takeaways because you want to have Serang? Um, basically that, you know, if you have funds in Sprout, you know, you need, you need to make some decisions right now. You know, if you feel that there is, you know, a high risk and frankly, it's very difficult to know, you know, then you need to get your funds out soon. If you feel that there is no risk, you know, you should still probably migrate your funds anyway. That's going to be the best thing to do. Um, but, you know, maybe you have a little bit more leeway to try to do this more correctly, you know, and at any rate, you know, if, if this is something you care about, you know, definitely reach out to the Zcash company or to your wallet provider and, you know, figure out what they're doing about Turnstile in order to make this both easy and safe. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Serang, for joining today to talk about this. Um, we didn't, again, anticipate recording this episode, but we felt like it would be useful to do it uh, in light of recent news. Uh, thank you for watching our first episode of Breaking Zcash. We're not sure if there will be a, a new episode so uh, after this, though. It might just be a one and done. Um, or if 
maybe this will become a recurring series, sort of like breaking Monero, but no promises there. Um, and uh, take care, everyone. Thanks for watching.